I'm extremely grateful for, for Deidre's, McCloskey's presence among us. Uh, to, to begin to mention or to introduce her to you will be an impossible task. I mean, some of you are here probably because you know who she is, but let me try. I mean, at least I will give you the formal biographical note, and then uh, you will get a sense as she speaks of what kind of person she is. So Deidre Nancy McCloskey has been uh, with the uh, University of uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. She's she has a distinguished professor of economics, history, and English. English and communication at that university. She's trained at Harvard as an economist. She has written 16 books and edited seven more and has published some 360 articles on economic theory, economic history, philosophy, rhetoric, feminism, ethics, and law. She taught for 12 years in economics at the University of Chicago, or 12 years at and describes herself now as a postmodern free market quantitative Episcopalian feminist Aristotelian. <laughs> <laughs> Her latest books are How to Be Human, with an asterisk somewhere, somewhere there, uh, though an economist published in 2001, Measurement and Meaning in Economics, which she edited with, uh, with a colleague in 2001, The Secret Sins of Economics, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2002, The Cult of Statistical Significance, How the Standard Era Costs Us Jobs, Justice and Lives. She co-wrote the book with Stephen Ziliak and published in 2008. The Bourgeois Virtues, Ethics for an Age of Capitalism is one of these books if it's there. 2006, Bourgeois Dignity, Why Economics Can't Explain the Modern World, University of Chicago 2010, and Bourgeois Equality, How Ideas, Not Capital Institutions Enrich the World, University of Chicago 2016. Before the Bourgeois Virtues, her best known books were The Rhetoric of Economics, University of Wisconsin Press in 85, and then 98, and, uh, and Crossing, a memoir, University of Chicago, 1999, which was a New York, no New York Times notable book. And uh, without further ado, please help me welcome Deirdre McCarthy to the podium. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a speech defect which you, uh, which you can either adjust to or run screaming from the room. It's a free country. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is the is is my topic this evening, which is how we grew so rich. Now we're inclined to think I'm not rich. Are you rich? Are you rich? And you're rich? No, you're. I need more money. <laughs> there is a psychological finding which has been reproduced a lot which is that everyone, regardless of their income, believes that they would be perfectly happy with 30% more income. I guess Bill Gates, 30% more. Um, but we are, we um, Americans or, or Brits or, um, are rich, and not just us. This enrichment is spreading to the world. To believe this, you have to understand how very poor people were on the main frontier in 1800. There's a wonderful book about a Mainer uh, um, woman who was a, uh, who was a m m midwife. Um, and her life was walking through ice-covered streams in the middle of the night, being cold all the time, having one dress for church, maybe a couple of other um, dresses, um, shoes that leaked, and so forth. She, of course, didn't have electricity. You know, the next time you switch on the light, think we've gone back to, go, gone back to living in caves because in the cave, the, here's a cave. Y you, you turn out the lights, it's dark. You switch them, boo. We, uh, I have two artificial hips, which in my grandmother's time was an experimental procedure, which often didn't work. Now it's become so routine that my surgeon does 400 a year 
400, you know, end of problem. My advice to young people is that if you're going to get arthritis, make sure it's in your hips. <laughs> and on and on and on, this institution. Uh, whenever I use the word institution, I, I think of Mae West, who said, I'm in favor of the institution in marriage, but I'm not ready for an institution. <laughs> but, so let's, let's call it a college or a university, is an example of the astounding way, even in rich America, even America that in 1800 was well above the world average, we've come. It was quite common in the United States of 1800 that people couldn't read, most particularly in the South, but not only in the South. Um, slaves were forbidden to learn to read. I, so we were very poor. And the world in general, you can think of it this way, got along person by person on about $2 a day. Now imagine living in Portland on $2 a day. This is, this is not in 1800 prices, this is in two, 2019 prices. You'd have, well, you wouldn't have much. You, you might be able to feed yourself. Since everyone around you was poor, uh, you thought, well, that's OK. Except your children died in enormous numbers. Two thirds of your children died before coming to much maturity. I have two great and great, great grandmothers who died in, in childbirth, which was, was commonplace. So $2 a day still characterizes some parts of the world. But a percentage or an absolute amount, a number of people in the world that's falling like a stone and has for the last 40 or 50 years. When I was a college student in the 1960s, one could speak out of a world population of five um, uh, a billion. I was going to say trillion, but I've gotten lost in the national debt. Uh, <laughs> out of the five billion people on the planet, Four billion were unspeakably poor. Campfire cooking, which you, you might do as an, an amusement on the beach, uh, you know, boil the water and eat the lobster or something, but you wouldn't want to do it every day for your life. Now, with a population of perhaps seven and a half billion people in the world, the bottom billion, this $2 a day group is only 1 billion. So it's fallen in absolute numbers and even more dramatically in percentage numbers. The other way of appreciating how much it's changed, well, is to start with the quantities. I'm an economist. I, 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 I love numbers. I love poetry too, so you know that's, that's nice. Um, and as you pointed out, I'm an Episcopalian, so I, 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 I love the mass too. Um, but numbers. Now from that $2 a day, average income in the world is about $30 a day. Think of Brazil as as, to, as, as the average as it is about. China is coming up close to Brazil from a remarkably low $1 a day under Mao. India, in two generations, will have a European standard of living if it continues growing as it is. Now it's growing slightly faster than, than China. Actually, 
considerably faster. So it's $30 a day average for the whole world, including all these poor places, somewhat poor places like Brazil or China. But in a place like the United States or Finland or Japan, it's over $100 a day. You go from $2 or $3 a day to $100 a day. Or in the case of the United States, $130 a day for every man, woman, and child. Now, of course, it's not distributed equally. But equality of substance has substantially improved since 1800 or 1900 or even, 19, even 19, no, 1950, even in the inegalitarian United States. Because although Lilian Betancourt, the heiress to the uh, L'Oreal cosmetic fortune, the richest woman in the world, I think she died, which is too bad, but she died, she died in possession of, I don't know, 20 yachts, <laughs> six chateaux. She gave to her charitable foundation. Andrew Carnegie gave 100%. She gave 1.5%. So you, that's to give you a feeling of the kind of jerk we're, we're dealing with here. <laughs> but unless you care that she owns all these yachts, the poor cannot be substantially made better off, not in the magnitude of what I call the great enrichment of the 19th and 20th century, not this move from $2 a day to $30, $100, $130 dollars a day. My Norwegian cousin's glory in $150 a day, which makes the Swedes very unhappy. Once the Norwegians were the poor country cousins, now they're richer than the Swedes, even. It's very irritating for them. <laughs> so there's this amazing change, unique in human history. And it's extremely important, I think, for economists and historians and the rest to understand why it happened. Because if we don't know why it happened, we might screw it up. And there are many ways of screwing up. August 1914, October 1917, these are two possibilities for not achieving the enrichment, not just in money. <clears throat> I can say with assurance that in this room, we have enlightened people, educated people, people who are intellectually, spiritually, artistically curious. Every one of you here, or you would run screaming from the room. So it's not just that we've gotten more Fritos or more beer. Um, it's that we're fuller, we're able to have fuller, longer, much longer human lives. The examples of the of the technical and organizational institutional changes are endless. This university is modeled, whether you quite know it or not, on the University of Berlin in 1810. Because what it does is combine teaching and research. That's what virtually every modern American and other universities or colleges do. That was an invention an organizational invention. The obvious technological inventions are electric lights. Um, this is one of my favorite examples, dropped ceilings. What a clever idea. <laughs> I mean, it's not high science. You don't need to know uh, uh, the, the theory of a, uh, 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 the atomic theory to do it. You just have to have steel strips inexpensive from the invention of inexpensive steel in the middle of the 19th century in, 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 in Germany and, and Britain. Uh, and then you have this stuff, and I haven't ever established what it is. It's in the middle, but it's light. And all the electrical stuff, maybe the plumbing too, but it hasn't leaked yet, is up there, easy to get, easy to, get to.
not in the reinforced concrete, which modern buildings like this are constructed of. Reinforced concrete was invented by a French gardener. He wanted to make pots that could hold trees, small trees. You make a clay pot that's just clay, it'll fall apart because you add the water, boom, it falls apart. So let's see, let's put in this new stuff they've invented, chicken wire. <laughs> and sure enough, it held to, to, together. Hence, um, concrete, you re reinforce concrete. Organizational changes. 1956, um, a, a trucker in North Carolina thought, hmm, suppose we have standardized boxes, strong so that they can withstand being piled on top of each other, and we put them on ships and send them off to China or, or Holland. And that was the beginning of containerization, which is gigantic, which has caused the new globalization. So that's what we call in, in, we Latinists called an explicandum, the thing to be explained. This amazing, unique change. There had been increases before in income per head occasionally under the good emperors in the Roman Empire uh, a century or so. Maybe income per head in the Roman Empire increased by a factor of two in the Song Dynasty in China. <clears throat> early in the second millennium CE. Commerce was developing very well and lots of invention. 1492, if you, wanted, if you thought there was going to be a great enrichment and you were making a bet, you would have bet the farm on China, not on these quarrelsome and impoverished Europeans. There had been doublings before. But they always fell back after a while to this one, two, three dollars a day per person. So what's the explanation? Well, here's my explanation, which is the only correct one. <laughs> it's liberalism in the root sense of a society of free people, no slaves, no subordination, of women to men. No subordination of workers to bosses who own them. No subordination, no colonialism. Free, free people in the sense that everyone here is free. That idea in the 18th century was new. Thomas Jefferson famously wrote with the help of the Benjamin Franklin, all men and women, dear, are created equal. Now, this was a man who held his children in slavery. So I'm, I'm a little bit disturbed by Tom. But this idea, Mary, Mary Wollstonecraft, Tom Paine, Voltaire, this was a new idea. In an agricultural society, there are the stationary bandits called lords who run the place and own the land by virtue of their sword and their horse. And all the rest of us take it there are no descendants of the crowned heads of Europe or Asia or Africa here. Um, all the rest of us were the serfs, the peasants. So it was liberalism. Now, how does that work? <clears throat> well, the idea is, the core idea, which comes most clearly in this last book. These are three books. By the way, they're, they're in spoken books, 30 hours. It's a great thing to read on, the, on your commute. But there are three books. There's a third, which is in, invisible, called The Bourgeois Virtues which asks the question, is it evil to be in business? And the answer is no. And this one that says, well, are the usual explanations correct of how we got rich? Foreign trade, investment, exploitation, imperialism. No, they're not right. And the third one says, what is right? 
and says it's freedom that made us rich. And here's how it works. In a society that is liberal in this sense, this, this root and sense, you're allowed to have a go, as the English say. Have a go. This is a sporting metaphor. The English have invented most games, and they're very sporting in their vocabulary. Um, I, 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 you know, I'm a, I'm a Anglophile of a somewhat extreme sort. I'm a cricket fan. So I understand all the terminology. In fact, I've played the game. Um, keep a straight bat and, and, and watch out for the googlies. Um, all right. It gave people permission to try out stuff. This is something that Alexei de Tocqueville noticed in his tour of the United States in the 1830s, which he wrote about in his great book, D Democracy in America. He noticed that the average white male <laughs> American, uh, not subject to a master, a lord, viewed himself as equal to this French uh, aristocrat. He could see it in how they, how they talked to him. And this is how Americans uh, um, talk to each other. And he could see it in their enterprise, in their spirit of trying things out. And it turns out that if you let people try things out, they come up with a bunch of ideas. Some of them are lousy and don't succeed, and others are good and succeed. And it's not just these fancy technological inventions we're talking about. It's not just Edison and electric lights. It's also the woman who opens a hairdressing salon in, in her neighborhood that turns out to be what the neighborhood needs. I certainly need it desperately. I mean, get me to a hair salon quickly. Or, or, or the working man who's willing to move to North Dakota to the oil fields when it's when, 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 when there's money to be made there. That kind of flexibility is as important as the high, as the high science that my friend Joel Mokir, who's also an economic historian, puts so much emphasis on. Until really 1900, in fact, well after 1900, science is not what distinguishes Northwestern Europe, which is where all this began, from from the rest of the world. Need to go back to 1492, Chinese science at the time was superior to science in, in Europe without any question. So it's not science. And indeed, the key to understanding that it's not these other things, that's this book here, um, is it's not the usual suspects rounding up the usual suspects in Casablanca. Um, it's this change in spirit. It's this change in the, the permission to try out things. And it's crucial to understanding the truth of this. I, I told you at the beginning this was the correct explanation. I want you to go home and say, you know, I heard the correct explanation for modern economic growth. Wow, that's terrific. <laughs> Send in your nominations for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, what, what, what makes it terribly plausible that it was a very widespread, this is key, a democratic, a Walt Whitman type Um, freeing of people from subordination. First poor white men, then slaves, then women for the first time, then, then Catholics, then, 
then women for the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time, and the f oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, it, uh, uh, then, the, then gays, then colonial people, then this, then that. More and more people brought into the space where they could try things out. And they, they could have a go, and go they did. Now, why don't the other arguments work? Because the magnitude is too great. A factor of 15, a factor of 30, a factor of higher. <laughs> I gave a talk similar to this to the Cambridge Department of Cultural Anthropology, Cambridge, England, and a famous historical anthropologist whose work I admire very much stood up after my talk and said, well, you know, I, I can understand this factor of 30 that you talk about. That corresponds with my research. But that can't be, but 3,000% can't be right. Go back to the fourth grade. A factor of 30 is 3,000%, roughly. I didn't laugh at him. And I gently turned to another subject. But it's 3,000% we're talking about here, and higher if you include improved quality of goods. Look, medicine in 1800, <laughs> not a good idea. <laughs> Going to a doctor, go maybe to this midwife in Maine, she, she knew what she was doing. But not to the early obst male obstetricians with their instruments. Um, Think of, uh, think of all kinds of things that have improved. Glass, plate glass. We now use glass for walls. You may have noticed it's all over the place. Big pieces of glass, the size of that thing. This, you couldn't do that before the, be, before the Second World War. The carpet here, this lovely, uh, inexpensive, uh, no, no, um, <laughs> wonderful carpet. Uh, cheap steel. Wood. Here in Maine, you've got lots of wood. Things are made of wood. Well, that requires a bandsaw. Bandsaws were invented and then made possible, again, by the invention of steel. And it, we had steel before for swords and stuff, but not for, not for mass use. OK. It's the magnitude that's the problem. Let's take colonialism <clears throat> as a standard explanation for why Europe grew rich. We still feel guilty about colonialism. Let's, let's throw it in with slavery, which Americans properly feel very guilty about. Uh, was that the source of the enrichment I'm talking about? Well, now look. There are all kinds of things wrong with that argument. One of them is that unlike slavery, colonialism was not on the whole stealing, particularly the French and English versions of colonialism. The English stole from the Indians, from the, from the South Asians, for a while in the 18th century. Then they stopped. And then what they did is traded with the Indians, with the South Asians. That's all they did. They true, they got, they had jobs for twits from minor public schools in the empire. But that's all. It was a very light-handed empire. Now the, the French em empire in, in Africa and in, um, and in Southeast Asia was more heavy-handed. But still, it wasn't a great source of enrichment for the metropolis. The extreme example is Belgium, which acquired an empire by the Treaty of Berlin, namely Congo. But Congo was owned by the king. So Leopold II, when rubber became vulcanized and useful, and boy, let's have rubber on our 
on our carriages and then our bicycles, and boy, that's great. He owned the rubber tapping possibilities of Congo by himself. Ordinary Belgians got not a cent of advantage from it. It went into palaces in the south of France, which is a nicer place to live than Belgium. So colonialism didn't work if the idea is that it's to make the metropolis rich. Slavery didn't work for the same reasons. It's customary to echo the noble sentiments of the second inaugural and to say that if it's the God's will that this war go on until all the wealth piled up by the 400 years of slavery be dissipated, the edicts of the Lord are good altogether, or words to that effect. But that's not true. I, I know it's offensive to talk this way, and I'm, I apologize for the offense, but it's not the case that American economic growth depended on cotton. It's not the case that cotton depended on, on slavery. It's not the case. Slavery wasn't why we became rich. In any case, stealing from people only has limited uh, fruits. Do you think you'd make a lot of money stealing from the homeless people in Portland? Or from the poor, for that matter, from the working poor? If you're, if you're British and you want to steal, steal from the French. <laughs> Come on, let's get serious here. Go where the money is, as the famous bank robber said. So the extractions of exploitation aren't it. Well, let, let me just make one more point, then we can talk for a while. That's kind of the left's version of why we got rich. Then there's the right's version, the conservative version, which is that we got rich from saving. These rich people are really nice. They save a lot because <laughs> they can't think of anything else to spend their vast amounts of money on. So they save a lot, and they put it back in the economy, and that makes us rich, makes you and me who aren't rich, makes us rich. Because, you know, the railways get financed by rich people and so forth. That's mistaken. And the reason it's mistaken is diminishing returns. Suppose, I don't advise this, but um, I, I would ask you to not do it if, if you ask me. Suppose the, the university decided to make a building exactly like this one next door. Would it earn as much? Would it be as valuable in educational uses as this first building is? Uh -uh. If that doesn't persuade you, let's make a third building exactly like this one just right next door. And a fourth <laughs> and a fifth. Sheer investment doesn't make a community rich. Pouring money into a community, unless it's directed to good projects that come from people's minds, doesn't make people rich. There's no multiplier. That's bad economics. You don't just pour money into the west side of Chicago and solve the problems of the west side of Chicago. You find good things to do. And those come from letting free people try out things. So we're back to this core idea of this evening. There are two core ideas. One is that economic growth is enormous in the last two centuries. And the other is that its explanation is freedom. Neither the left nor the right has, it, has, has got the correct story. It's human freedom. It's being allowed to be creative. That's what made us rich. After millennia 
of not being free. So that's my tale. Thank you very much. I'll be glad to, what I'll actually be glad to do is sit down. Because although I got my hips done, you know, it goes on and on, as some of the older people here may know. Now it's my knees. Ah, ah. I can, we can have a nice conversation afterwards with the old people about, well, my right okay. knee is doing blah, blah, blah. If you have questions, please <laughs> raise your hand. There are microphones on both, both sides of the room. And I'll try to be brief. I, I want McCloskey. different kinds of voices. We have a diversity and of questions. You, you try to be brief, and I'll try to be brief. But look, I've written 1,700 pages on this topic. <laughs> so be a little indulgent. I don't know. Forgive me. There's a question back here. Yeah. Would you put the Chinese experience going yeah. from almost yeah. abject poverty under Mayo yeah. to what is now a tremendous advancement? Yeah in the context of your theory. I sure would. And, and, and my theory, this argument that I'm talking about, gains a tremendous amount of plausibility because of the experience of China and India. Because what they did, China in 1978, India in 1991, is they started to liberalize parts of their economy. And the parts, now, people speak of the Chinese model. Oh, boy, tyranny is good for growth. No, it's not. The parts of the Chinese economy where the government left people alone, those were the parts that succeeded. I want my socialist friends, and I have, have lots of them, to be, to be given an all-expenses-paid trip to Shanghai to stand at what's known as the Bund and look across the, r the r river at an area that was one, not long ago was Paddy Fields, and say to themselves, my God, if the government does platting and puts in a few streets and then lets people build stuff for profit, look what happens. The parts of China that are still under the, the government's thumb work very poorly. China has more high-speed rail than the the entire rest of the world combined. And it's everywhere. You ought to see it. It's incredible. I've been on it. It goes 300 miles, not, to, it goes, uh, it, it, it goes 200 miles an hour. Whiz! On um, viaducts, you know, 50 feet above the ground. It's an insane project for a poor country like that. You know, a country, Slightly poorer than Brazil. B br please, I hope Brazil doesn't start building high-speed rail to make rich people better off. So China is, and then India. I Actually, I'm more optimistic about India than about China, but they're both going to be rich countries. It's 40% of the world population. And if other countries, like my countries that I know and love, I've taught in South Africa, for example, if South Africa would just adopt what the Indians have adopted across the Indian Ocean, South Africa, instead of growing at 2% per year per capita, would start growing at 6% per year per capita. 6% per year per capita solves a lot of social problems, not instantly, but within a generation or two. Sorry, you see, I got a lot of material here. I could, it's hard oh, to re re restrain myself. The next person who speaks after this man has to be female. OK, girls, come on. Hold up the standard. Go ahead. You think I'm not female? <laughs> <laughs> Smart Alec. <laughs> so here's my question. The, um, regarding the political, economically entrenched wealthy and their pushbacks with nativism, sexism, classism, you racism, bet. and so on, it, uh, uh, pro short. probably as trying to divert our attentions and our energies, how, are you concer how concerned are you about all of this? Look, I'm 
reading a book right now about Hannibal. Not Hannibal Lecter, <laughs> but <laughs> Hannibal, the, the Carthaginian enemy of Rome. And Carthage and Rome work the same way. When have the rich not run the place? You know, it, sort of a nasty version of the golden rule, which I take very seriously as a Christian, is those who have the gold rule. <laughs> not very nice. But in what society has that not been the, the problem? So I, I am on your side. Let's, let's stop it. Let's try to, I mean, there are various things we can do. We might di, di, di disagree on, a bit on what they are. But I don't think it's anything new. Congress has been for sale since the early, I think probably since the first day it met. Um, uh, Mark Twain said, I think it could be proven by facts and figures that the only indigenous criminal class in the United States is Congress. <laughs> and, you know, so let's get together. Let's make sure that elections actually happen and there's no suppression of voting which is really the worst thing that the GOP has done, as is shown in North Carolina. OK, now this has to be from the, from, have a from the disc right app side. Has there not been, is that work? Is it working? Yeah. yeah, you have to do it rock music style. Has yeah. there not been a lot of Western investment in China a lot of companies moving to China because of cheap labor. No. No, briefly. Um, uh, foreign investment is not a very large item in the Chinese aggregate. Look, here's, here's why. You want to know why? The savings rate in China, now this is quite startling, of ordinary people like us is 50%. Huh? Pourquoi? What's going on here? Fifty percent? You save half of your income and put it under the mattress or in the bank? Well, that's because they don't have Social Security. They don't have um, state-paid health care. If you get sick in China, you're on your own, mate. So they're terrified, and I think they're also terrified of, of their government, or they should be. So. There's a tremendous amount of saving. Look, why is the interest rate so low? The older people here can remember mortgage rates, not, not the crazy ones of the inflation era, but back in the 50s of 5%, 6% mortgage rates. Uh, not anymore. They're much lower. Why is that? What's going on? My explanation, and there are some economists who agree with me, um, is the incredibly high Chinese savings rate. It's almost, it, the, their economy, although it's very poor, is almost as large as the American economy. So if they're saving half, we, we save 7.5% of our income. They save 50%. So there's this savings pouring into the, the, the world economy, driving down interest rates. So no, it's not, it's not, it's certainly not, them stealing trade secrets from the United States. That's not how they got rich. In fact, if you want me to say something controversial, as though nothing I've said has been controversial, um, <laughs> ste that they steal trade secrets is good for the world because patents are too long. Patents, and actually it's worse than copyright, the so-called Mickey Mouse Protection Act, that's what economists call it. 1998, the copyright on the image of Mickey Mouse was about to run out because it was 50 years after the death of Walt Disney. And so Walt Disney Corporation went to Congress, you remember what Mark Twain said, and he purchased it for a surprisingly small, they purchased it for a surprisingly small sum. And they passed, they raised the number of years from 50 to 70 after the death of the uh, creator. So this intellectual property stuff that you'll hear about um, 
I, I got somewhat radical views about. We, we have a question way in the back, Professor yeah. McCloskey. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you must like micro loans, the, the concept and the I do. programs. So thank you. I don't know if you want to speak on that more or does it power, empower the people and women? Oh, very much so. I heard him speak, actually. What's his name? Giannis something or other? What's his name? I can't remember. Yeah, Eunice. Eunice, I heard him speak. He's, 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 he's a charming speaker, and, and it's, it's a good idea. Um, we have to be careful, though, that we don't over-regulate the finance industry to the point where it's impossible to do such things. But no, I'm, I'm very much in. Look, you give women power. Now, this isn't just some because I'm a, I'm, I'm a first wave um, uh, um, feminist or something. Giving women the power, the economic power, so they're market women. They have a little stall, or they they're they're able to work in in a factory, as in in Bangladesh. Gives them a, in the first place, or or like the like the mill girls in early Maine, New Hampshire, and uh, Massachusetts, and, and Vermont, who went, who didn't have to go right from their father's domination to their husband's domination. They had a period in which they earned their own income. Anyway, that's very good for children, for rather obvious uh, reasons. The guy, not all of them, I'm sure there's no one here who does that, but. The guy, in, like in Angela's Ashes, drinks it up, his pay, his pay packet. Uh, she doesn't. She spends it on her on, on clothing and food for her kids. So this is something that uh, my colleague at Chicago, um, Theodore Schultz, Nobel Prize winner, emphasized as early as the 1950s. He said the key to economic development is raising up the educational and economic level of married women. I think I saw a hand right down in front here, and I might ask my friends to pass down the microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for an insightful, stimulating talk. Appreciate Good. it. Um, I'm an engineer, electrical engineer. I love Electri engineers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I love engineers. I'll explain to you why I love well, engineers in a minute. If you first answer a comment on what I'm going to say, I see a parallel between the development of the internet and the things that you're saying. Yeah. In that it's it's wide open. Hold it closer, to dear. You're an engineer. Remember. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> I. Uh, it's hard to remember sometimes. Um, but I see a parallel between the development of the internet, That's which right. I see is something which is very open, very free. Absolutely. And yes, a few people have made an awful lot of money on it. Yeah, sure. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Mark yeah, Zuckerberg yeah. to be one, yeah. Bill Gates. Uh, but um, is, is, is my parallel in line it's with what exactly you're saying? Right. It's exactly it's right. A, it's a current example. Thank you. Of, I feel better. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a matter of entry. It's crucial. You know, if you want public policy, and I'm very suspicious of a lot of public policies because they're often interested. It's often the farmers. I saw a shocking story in the newspaper this morning about the, the, about the maple sugar forest over close to Quebec. The subsidy was a quarter of the gross, the annual gross of the forest. What? You know, this is, doesn't sound like very good public policy to me. But if you're going to do public policy, focus on making sure that entry is easy. Because that's what gives people a chance to have a go and to, and to invent new things. Um, uh, the, 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 here's a terrifying number. In 1950, 5% of American occupations required a license from the government, 5%. Want to hazard a guess to what that figure is now? 30%. Now, that's not good. 
I have a friend in my church who's a hairdresser, a cosmetologist, and I made this point in a speech I was giving to try to persuade my progressive Episcopalian friends that socialism was not the way forward. And uh, she said, well, but, but, but dealing with people's scalp is very dangerous. You've got to be trained. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah OK, dear, I understand. But, but it, we don't have a license to be an economist. Anyone in this room, I invite you, can set up as an economist. <laughs> Come to you for economic advice. You can have a firm called Smart Economics. Go ahead, feel free. Free entry. So um, this is terrific. So implicit in what you've been talking about yeah. is also not just the ability to be free to talk about, to, to invent new gadgets, yes. but also the freedom to think and express, the freedom of, of ideas. And that also means the freedom to push back on ideas. And Indeed. In other words, a robust dialogue. Indeed. We've seen over the past five years some on university campuses, yeah. thankfully not so much ours here, but at a lot of university campuses, we've seen that ability to have yeah. a robust exchange of ideas be eroded yeah. by the heckler's veto, by disinvitations, that sort of thing. I'm wondering um, what your well, thoughts are on that in this larger context. What, but I would, I would observe that it's not most university campuses. Absolutely. It's not the bulk of undergraduates who are doing this. Middlebury, yes. <laughs> not here. <laughs> so um, in fact, I know Charles Murray slightly, and he was attacked at, at Middlebury. Look. I think it's bad. I, I we, we wish the kids and their faculty uh, enablers wouldn't do it. But there have been worse times, the McCarthy period, in which people were fired for be, being communists or talking like communists or having friends who are communists or, you know, being socialists. And so I think this too will pass. Uh, my friend Jonathan Haidt thinks that it's a direct result of child-rearing practices. When I was a kid, and I speak to the practically everyone here who can affirm it, when we were children, mom would say on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, go out and play, come back when the street lights come on. She might give you a sandwich peanut butter and jelly, in my case, with Wonder Bread. But, you know, that's it. And so we'd go play, and we'd have our disagreements, and our we'd do what we did as kids. Now, I don't need to tell you, it's all scripted. And many of the people in this room, you're doing it right now. Or your grandchildren are being made into snowflakes because of this, so <laughs> watch out. <laughs> Snowflakes melt. <laughs> we have a question over here. Um, you had said one of the reasons uh, that we should listen to you is to understand the reasons for this tremendous growth so that oh, yeah, we don't amazing. mess it up. What are three things we could do to screw it up? Well, there are two that come to mind immediately. Nationalism and socialism. Um, the, look, the, the intelligentsia, I call them the clerisy of the last three centuries, has had three ideas, one of which was great, liberalism, 18th century idea. The other two, nationalism, early 19th century, socialism, mid 19th century, are terrible. And if you think, oh, well, nationalism's not so bad, oh, no, socialism is nice, Maybe you'll like National Socialism, <laughs> <laughs> which, which was socialism. Don't, don't, don't think it wasn't. So I, I think those theories of pushing people around are really bad. The other and more obvious thing is war. The great tragedy of the 20th century was August 1914. I mean, to say that it was avoidable is an understatement. This was a completely unnecessary war, and yet it happened. Um, and all our woe. 
So let's not blow ourselves up. Let's not go down the road with Venezuela. Let's not uh, take the nationalist road that I'm, I don't know how many people here will oppose me on this, but the, the Trump road. I think we have a question right here in the middle, and then I'd love to hear from a student over on the other side of the room. Oh, yeah. Hey, I've got, I, you should have alerted me to that. I, okay, come on. Get ready, student body. <laughs> Thank you, Professor McCloskey, for, for, for being here. Um, a few years ago, I was down at Auburn University, and a professor by the name of Jorge Halsman mentioned, mentioned you. Um, and I was curious what your thought, in speaking of theories, What's your thoughts on economics used by the, by the Austrian methods and Austrian economists? Well, I'm all for Austrian economics, and I become more and more an Austrian economist. But the Auburn group, Hoppe in particular, um, are a little bit over the line for me. Hoppe just wrote a book in which he says the following. Because the environment of northern, say, Europe is tougher. Europeans have, involved, have evolved to be smarter than Africans. He said that. Now, 100 years ago, that would have gone without comment. People say, oh, yeah, that's right. Boy, I believe that. Because every, almost every scientist and intellectual believe that to be true. But it's complete nonsense. You think the, the deserts of the Kalahari, the Kalahari Desert, is uh, an easier life than uh, Munich? I mean, come on, let's get serious here. And it's, it's, but he's, that's, he's gone off in that direction. Whereas my friends at George Mason University, that's where the Austrian economists are. And they're, 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 they're very sweet. And they're interested in facts. I really think that if you're going to do economics or political science or sociology, you ought to be interested in how things actually are, not just kind of have an axiom that the world is perfect so we don't need to do anything, or the world is terrible and we need to blow it up. You need to measure the world and know it. You can't just go, half, go off half-cocked with a theory. Now a student. <laughs> can't be anyone but a student. And then it has to be a female student. The next question. So girls, get ready. Sure. Um, hi, great talk, by the way. Um, I just had a question about. Just ask it, dear. OK. I'm still trying to think about it. Good, good. So you talked a lot about um, Shanghai and how it went from rice paddies to like high rises. It was astonishing. Yeah. It's, and... called, the, it's, called, the, the, it's called, called the Pudong yeah. district. Uh, I was just wondering, if we give everyone a go of it, as you say, wouldn't that come at a cost to the environment and future generations? No, it, 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 it doesn't have to. I'm, I, I'm worried about the environment. I'm worried about global warming. I think it's caused by humans. I, you know, come on, I, 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 I go with the science in this. But I'm, A, reasonably optimistic, quite optimistic, actually, that this economic growth that's happening in places like China and India and continuing to happen, contrary to what you may have heard, places like the United States, will give us so many engineers, entrepreneurs, th uh, pe people working on this kind of problem that will solve it. Take particulate matter in cities. I can remember, and anyone who grew up in Boston can remember, that you, at the end of the day, your mom had cleaned the windowsill. You'd put your finger on the windowsill, and it would come up black because we were burning soft coal for heating all over Boston. And then we stopped doing it. They stopped in, in Britain after the horrible, um, when was it, it was 53, I think it was 53 or 54, the amazing smog um, descent. I was once in a P super in 1959, in which I couldn't see my feet. So I went back inside, which is the correct move to make. So no, things can be improved. The hole in the ozone layer. International cooperation took the thing that was causing the hole in the ozone layer, which turned out to be, in part, 
hairspray. And Margaret Thatcher, a really big user of hairspray, she, <laughs> she may have been the cause <laughs> of the hole in the ozone layer. She was one of the leaders of it. She was one of the leaders. So you don't have to be on the left to think this is a serious problem, but you don't have to despair. Now I need a female student. Come on, girls. OK, good. I went to Harvard, Harvard College, and the Radcliffe girls, as we call them, were smarter than the Radcliffe men. I mean, the, the Harvard men, because it was harder to get into Radcliffe than into Har Harvard College. Yet guess who did all the talking at the joint classes? Um, so you talked a lot about how freedom has led to this enrichment. What do you think um, we should be progressing towards to ensure more freedom uh, across the globe? Like, what global issues do you see that we should be working on? Oh, there on? are a ton of them. Equality and security for, for, for women is absolutely crucial. In Africa and many other countries, there's this incredible hostility, not just hostility, this attack on uh, gays. And this is stupid. And I mean, look, <laughs> uh, et cetera, et cetera. I was in Hungary two weeks before the last Ill, 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 Ill election. And Orban was running an anti-Semitic campaign. Hungary has about 11 million people. There are only 40,000 Jews left. Why is that, class? Do we know why that was? Um, there had been a survey of high school students, Hungarian high school students, asking them what percentage of this 11 million people was Jewish. I told you it's 40,000, actually. The high school students, on average, said 20%. So there's a thick attack on minorities. That's nationalism. That's the nationalist part of national socialism. Um, let me be more controversial. There will be some Trump voters here, and I respect your, your choice. It's a free country, but that's Trump's MO, too, is to say the Mexicans are coming or the Central Americans are coming, uh, the uh, transgendered people in the military, how terrible. The military doesn't care because many of them speak Arabic, which is a very useful language for, <laughs> you know, since we have 800 foreign bases. No, I, I, I think there are plenty of problems that people of goodwill can solve, but the basis of it has to be liberalism, not pushing people around. No violent compulsion of people. There is a student. So one thing that you talked about in your book a lot was now there's uh, there's a man of taste <laughs> in your book on equality was overconsumption yeah and uh, it seemed like in the early 1800s what the world needed was the the enrichment that you're talking about you bet and now that we're at the point of overconsumption being so great uh, yeah. it seems like maybe the the world needs something uh, new they need a new innovation to keep progressing due to... Uh, no. 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 Okay. In fact, in the chapters you're talking about, I, I firmly reject that view. Um, uh, Overconsumption is not a problem. Now look, I have 8,000 books in my loft in down, downtown Chicago. Now some might consider 8,000 books a little excessive, <laughs> um, but they're my tools, say I, um, uh, and, and my house is filled with books. The, the reason we're able to consume so much is not because we're greedy and stupid, but because we produce so much. 
that that's, it's not, it's not the other way around. It's not, oh, I like, I want to have more Fritos, therefore employment happens, and therefore we get rich in Frito making. No, it's the other way around. Um, so no, I, I don't think over, look, and here's implicit in the overconsumption point is what my grandmother used to say to me, your grandmother did too. If you didn't eat your peas, she said, think of the starving children in China. Now, not, you know, I could never understand that. Maybe I was beginning to be an economist. I, I, I thought, well, there's a plate of peas here. If I could send it to China, I'd be glad to. But I don't think that's practical. So really, Granny, I didn't say this to her. She was rather strict. Uh, she wouldn't have found this amusing. Uh, so redistribution is not the solution to the poor of the world. It's, it's just not. The solution is for them to be as productive as we are, for them to learn how to do the good things we do, and we to learn the good things they do, and for us to trade. That's, that's what we need to do. And then, you look, in about 100 years, maybe even 50 years, if we truly get our act together, everyone's going to be as rich as the United States. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. That's not, we're not, you know, when, 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 when the father's share of the weight, the poundage of the house goes down because his children are growing up and getting bigger, he doesn't lament it. And say, oh my God, once I was, you know, 60% of the weight of the house, now I'm only 20%. Come on, this is a good thing. So, uh, I, and, and by the way, I think it will, will result in a cultural explosion such as the world has never seen. It will be wonderful. More people will uh, engage in crafts such as, oh, by the way, I bought this this afternoon on your wonderful craft sh store on the street, what's the name, Congress Street. It's a terrific craft store. I urge you all to go to it. This, look at this, this cane. It's just beautiful. My God, expensive, <laughs> but beautiful. We'll do it. We'll, we'll, pr we'll pursue the transcendent in art and religion and the family in a more serious way because we won't be aching from hunger. So that I'm, I'm very optimistic. He's guys right stand here. up for a while. And then we'll go to the er. Now hold it close. Think of rock music. So I'm going back to where, where I think you started. Small groups of people are able to organize themselves and be incredibly yeah. productive. Yes, they are. But, but when you have 1,000 or 10,000 Chinese, and they say, you go and build this incredible thing 50 feet up in the air, yeah, yeah. they've learned some notion of investment. Yeah, where, I know. But where did that come from, and how did people learn how to defer their immediate gratification yeah. in this speculative activity of but, investment. But we've always done that. There is a view that comes from Max Weber, one of the great books of the last couple of hundred years, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, 1905, that people learn to save or learn to work hard. And this is baloney. People have always saved. Auschulian hand axes used by the precursors of us, Homo sapiens, before Homo sapiens, and then early Homo sapiens, for 1.3 million years. And Auschulian hand axe is not really an axe. It's a sharp edge with a dull side, so you can hold on to it without getting cut. And it's used for cutting into the hide of dead elephants that you found, or throwing at the hyenas trying to come t t t t to the elephant. And it, it, archaeological sites in Africa, which is where everyone here, by the way, is an African, in case you don't know. 
Uh, I told this to a cab driver in Chicago the other day. He was stunned. <laughs> he didn't believe it. But everyone here is an African. We, most of the people in this room, and certainly my people, came out of Africa and turned left. <laughs> it's not terribly informative, but we did. Until about 10,000 years ago, all our ancestors were black. We gradually lost m m melanin in, in our skin because of a, uh, if, you ha if you're black in Sweden, you don't get enough, uh, um, don't get enough uh, vitamin D from sun. But okay, in archeological sites, there are hundreds of these things. People made them in enormous numbers. Roman roads. Look, I'm a student of medieval agriculture, among other things. In the Middle Ages, in Europe, things were much better in this respect in China. But you put a quarter of your grain crop back into the ground every uh, spring or fall, depending on the kind of crop it was because yields per unit of seed were only four or five. You only got four or five wheat seeds from one you put into the ground. It's the seeds we ground up and eat. Well, come on, this is a disaster. This means one, this means that 20% of your income is being saved. So saving wasn't what was unusual about the modern world. It was ideas containerization, the University of Berlin. Those, those, that's what it is. Now, there was a woman here. Um, the Hold it close, dear. The advancement of liberalism yeah. benefits from open and fair discussion. It does, uh, for sure. In, in four like this or by reading. Yeah. What do we do with the biased media? Well, the, we've all, you know, again, I, I see, and I'm a historian. I'm trained as an economist, but I'm a historian down to my, I don't know. I love dead people. <laughs> the more dead, the better. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's always been so. Look, this is an amazing fact. I was a professor of communication, and we study these kinds of things. In 1792, in Britain, sort of original quasi-liberal place, although still very, very traditional. 1792, listen to this. Half of the newspapers were secretly owned by the government. Now, this was before the invention of the steam press. So we're talking about short-run uh, uh, on printing, where you can do maybe 4,000 copies max a day. And then with the steam press, you could do half a million copies per day. And that changed the whole character of journalism. And the newspapers became much more independent. But in those days, they were biased <laughs> on purpose with the very purpose of attacking Thomas Jefferson or doing whatever they were trying to do in the most scurrilous ways, making the National Enquirer look like journalism. Um, so we've always had this problem. We can't, there's no trick to getting unbiased truth. We have to argue it out, exactly as you said. It's got to be free discussion with people trying to be open-minded and trying to, try, try, trying to listen. In fact, I'm going to read to you, if I can find my purse. Oh, it's behind here. I, I'm going to read to you a motto that I carry around in my purse, which was written by Emily Oxenberg Rorty. Um, Dick Rorty, the philosopher's first wife. I'm going to put this down. It's like, you know, when you're on the phone, you say, I'm going to put you down. <laughs> it's stupid, but we do it. And there it is now. It's in here. Uh, this will take a while. <laughs> it's worth it. Believe me. Turn it. Right. Oh, wait. Is 
that it now? God, I hope I can find it after all this. Well, I don't know. It would take me a while to find it. Here's what she said. Hold it close. <laughs> is, is that right? No. Um, she said in 1983, what's important is the continuous conversation, the open conversation, where we, li where we change our minds because we've, because, we've, because we've listened to our friends' questions and objections. Lunatics change their minds, too. Uh -huh. But they change their minds with the phases of the moon, not because they've listened, really listened, to their friends' questions and objections. And it seems to me that that's the core of the scientific life, the humanistic life, the political life, the personal life. If you don't listen to your husband, at least a little bit, you're not going to get it. He's not listening to you. I know, I know. But, <laughs> but, but you, you try in a marriage, if you're going to make the marriage work, you've got to do you got to be trying to understand each other as hard as it is. And I think that's, that's, what a, that's what a serious open conversation is about. So there's no trick. There's no, look, hey, here, here, le, 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 ups, <laughs> here, put it this way. Would you like a government office of correct news? Now, wait a second. Turkey has one. <laughs> Russia has one. There's no referee who can, you know, it's, it's, it's like advertising. In the United States, there's a lot of hostility to advertising. I call it commercial free speech. Not commercial free speech, <laughs> but commercial free speech. And you know, maybe Coke isn't the real thing. <laughs> but I don't want, I certainly don't want a government agency deciding whether Coke is the real thing. I want it to be an open debate. Well, this has been, did you have another question? Are you escaping or what? Uh, he's do you want one last question? Yeah, one last question. Thank you so much for coming to Portland. Uh, you mentioned you were an optimist, and it just I brought am. to mind um, the rational optimist. Yes, of, uh, by my friend Matt Ridley. Matt Ridley, thank you. Um, he posits in there that trade comes before language because anthropologists have found shells so far inland in Africa that yeah. uh, would have only gotten there by trade um, to necessitate uh, fish hooks or whatever as Matt a, as stole that story from me. Oh. <laughs> so you do agree? I do agree. Interesting. But I don't think it predates language. That's the f finding from the Blombos Cave, uh, 80,000 BCE, where, where you get these extraordinary, this, this uh, finding of little shells with holes in them arranged like a necklace, because they were a necklace. But the, the string has rotted. And as Matt says, and I said, the, um, this is a 150 miles from what, what the coastline was at the time. Matt, Matt, by the way, is a Viscount. And uh, he was on TV. His family has been helpful to the, to the monarchy and, and the government since the 16th century. So this is an old noble family. And they own coal mines in the northeast of England, which are mostly closed. And Matt, who's a conservative, is in the House of Lords. Um, <laughs> his, he was on a TV show. He's a journalist, arguing with a socialist who kept calling him a coal baron, because he had coal. That's how his family got rich. 
And he, he and I were c c coming down the stairs in the House of Lords. He said to me, no, you, you know what irritates me about this is that I'm not a bloody baron. I'm a viscount. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he said, I realize that this wouldn't have been rhetorically effective to complain. <laughs> Okay, dears, it's it's been fun. Thank you very much. <laughs>